Hey TV fans, welcome to this special video, Board Now back with Rachel McDonald. And we're going to be talking about Stranger Things 2 and Stranger Things 3. So we covered season one on the channel together. So all those reviews are up on the channel. And we will be covering season four, which is coming up starting next week. Season two, I sort of, I think I described it in one of my reviews. And it, it you know, it does feel like the Empire Strikes Back of like for Stranger Things. Because it, it does feel like... It, it it does a lot of what you liked about season one and I think also it feels like a darker season which I appreciated and that's something um than people say obviously about Empire Strikes Back then it's a lot like Star Wars but it's darker and there's a bit more adult stuff going on into the characters but so it sort of feels like that. I, I think that's maybe why I do still like these these three seasons. Like I do stand up for the later seasons because they do feel like like good sort of movie sequels. And if you think about like sequels to movies, it's sort of like they don't have to be as good as the original. All they have to do is be good and work on their own and add stuff to the overall picture so i mean that's another reason i like them because they're adding to the mythology of stranger things um now obviously there's a debate to be had should should it have been left alone after season one and and stuff like that and Obviously, I can go either way on that one. I mean, if it had been left at just one season, then fine. That would have been great. And I would have still have loved that opening season, that first season, watching it, re-watching it. But to me, when you've got characters this good and the writing's this good and you've got really great production and effects and stuff, then... To me, it, you never complain about having more of, of this sort of show when you enjoy it so much. And I do appreciate the darker feel to seasons two and three. They do go even more darker and more intense than season one. And it's sort of because of the genre, you know, sci-fi events, and they add to the world. They add to the mythology of the world with, like, new creatures, sort of new ideas. Make it very clear that I do love Stranger Things. I really do. And I do love the characters. And even though I'm going to have complaints, I do enjoy aspects of seasons two and three. However, yeah. I am very firmly in the camp that believes that this season that this show should only have been one season for me season one was so complete and so good and wrapped everything up it it, it, it just felt so complete and so good and wrapped up that storyline so well that for me anything that comes after is kind of like not needed but that being said one thing I love about this show, and one thing that it does continue to do well, is the characters and their characterization. And I think season two in particular is really, really good at this. I think the character journeys in season two are probably the best in the show. I love watching the dynamics that season two has. I love watching the development. You've got Elle and Hopper, you know, growing into this new father-daughter relationship. You've got Joyce trying to, you know, in her new relationship with Bob and, oh, we're going to talk so much about Bob. Bob Newberry is like, oh my God, we I love Bob so much. So that's so that's gonna be a whole thing later on. But you've got her dynamics, then you've got her, you know, trying to let go of her fear when it comes to Will. Will, oh my God, Will this season. Noah Schnapp, like, where is his Emmy? His performance this season is brilliant. And I actually really do like seeing the after effects of what happened to him, you know, like, cause he was gone for so long by himself in season one. So to see the after effects of that and to see how the upside down is still trying to get to him, that's really interesting. I think Mike has a great arc this season with him trying to deal with his grief and his trauma and, you know, his, his supposed how he feels he fails 11. Steve Harrington, king of everything is mm. so good this season like oh my god fantastic um i think 
the only characters I have to complain about this season are Nancy and Jonathan, and we'll get into that later because I, I feel yeah. some disagreements brewing beneath the surface oh, when it oh, comes I to Nancy be, yeah. and Jonathan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think season two, I don't think it was necessary, but I think it does a very good job of showing the aftermath from season one, if that makes sense. Like season yeah. one had so much shit go down that it's like, well, what happens when everything calms down? What happens to these people? What trauma do they go through? What after effects do they still experience? And I think season two was really good at exploring that. So I do enjoy season two to a certain extent, but again, part of me does feel like it was unnecessary. The new characters that are added in season two, look, I love Max. Everyone loves Max. Max is a great as character, you as you should. Sadie Sink is brilliant. But, I mean, you could take her out of the season and it wouldn't really make much of a difference, you know? Like, her and Billy, Billy, oh. We'll, we'll talk about Billy. We'll talk bit. about that. We I feel be. that they don't really add that much to this season as far as, like, like I feel like you could really take them out of the season and it wouldn't affect much. Um, and then there's creepy conspiracy theory guy who I really don't like. We're going to have words about like him, him because he is creepy He's funny. and weird and feeding underage kids alcohol and encouraging them to sleep together. It's, 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 we're going to talk about Murray. He's, he's a bit of an issue, <laughs> but, um, oh, yeah. I watched these two mostly for the characters because I think the character yeah. work is superb. Uh, the story itself, eh, it's okay. I mean, I, I, I remember there was this video essay, I think I sent it to you recently, where they basically talk about how in season one, it's a big mystery. You spend three quarters of season one not knowing what the hell is going on. So the whole point is to find out exactly what's going on. So it's like, you do find that out at season one. You find out about Hopkins, you find out about the Upside Down, you find out about the Demogorgon. So in season two, it's like, well, we already know all this stuff. We know that Hopkins are bad. We know there are Demogorgons coming from the Upside Down. We know there's another world. There's no well, mystery. Well, yeah, but, but you are, I mean, I agree in a way there's no mystery, but you still, mm. as I said, these, with both these sequel seasons, it, it expands on the mythology. You know, mm. you, you hadn't really seen, like, these monsters as, like, small creatures, which we actually see in this season. And it, it definitely, you know, it just adds to what came before, which is what I think good sequel should do. You know, if you just treat this as like a movie type sequel. Um, I think with, like, if you just take movie sequels, like if you use an example like Back to the Future, I think yeah. the reason that trilogy is so good is because the two sequels they still feel like Back to the Future movies. They they have like the classic trademarks and they sort of play on them, but they they sort of add to the mythology as well and they add something a little bit different. So mm. I think that's what these seasons are, are doing. I mean, I think you're probably right. Then the the plots are very similar. So they think you need a sense of mystery in this one. You know, because obviously there's still surprises. There's still, you know, things that unravel in the show. It's pretty obvious then, you know, unless it's one of those shows that makes it clear from the start what everything mm. is and stuff. So you're never going to have the same sense of freshness, but um, the Mac stuff and, and Sadie Sink, because mm. I, I feel her character is justified because this is a coming of age show and i think so it sort of shows then as these boys get older they're gonna experience love and they're gonna be interested in girls and i mean i'm obviously i'm not saying that's her only purpose because as the mm. show goes on she grows into a character of her own right and she she I mean, basically showing up for Halloween in a Michael Myers outfit. I did love that. <laughs> it means she can do no wrong for me, basically. From the start. <laughs> I, I love the fact that she she's like an expert at arcade, you know, games. That sort of makes her cool and subverts that whole thing. Because even the boys in the show, they sort of think, well, it, it must be a guy, you know, because mm. surely a <laughs> and they're surprised when they hear a girl's like so good at these games. Um, so 
obviously like you i like the actress a lot equal seasons i suppose you do have to add to the cast otherwise you risk maybe things getting stale um True. characters are not needed or for the plot but i think this is a very character driven show and mm. i think maybe because of the stuff with billy and the way that develops then you see her purpose a bit more in some ways because of that stuff um mm. but like in a way like you can debate characters and how good they are compared to each other but I don't know, in some ways, like, you could say, well, is Lucas particularly needed in season one? But he, he's just part of the group, and he's a good character, and he adds something different. Mm. to the. And I think Max adds something different. Yeah. Like, I, I wouldn't take Max out of the show. Like I said, I do love her character. I just feel that, like, it just really was not necessary to have her and Billy mm. in season two. Like, for example, Bob's character. If you took Bob out of season two, things would change because he yeah. actually does help move the plot along. Whereas if you True. took Max and Billy out, like, really nothing would change. But that being said, Max's character, especially in season three, is really fantastic. And I love in season yeah. three when we get to talk about it, how her dynamic with certain other characters help other characters to grow. You know, her and Elle in season three are, they're like my favourite aspect of season season three is that friendship and how yeah and how it really helps Elle come out of a shell um but I I find in season two she's a little bit superfluous a great character but a a little bit not needed and I didn't like and again luckily they rectify it in season three but I don't like how season two just does pit her and Elle against each other just a tiny bit but like I said they 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 straighten that out in season three so I I could forgive that in like retrospect I was like okay that you you made good with that one it's okay and they're kids they're kids and they're gonna have stupid jealous feelings and be you know and, and yeah. have that kind of stuff happen so it's not a huge complaint um it was just a little bit annoying i remember when i first watched it i was like don't do that don't pit the girls against each other just let them be friends and they did so it, it worked out yeah I, I mean obviously it's more for mel's point of view isn't it like she's yeah more max actually tries to be max great. actually tries yeah but uh, l is is not it's just because it she's because oh, they hint at maybe a love triangle there but they they never really go with it so it's fine no i that way because of all the soap operas she's been watching as well like she's been watching oh, like okay. these shows that, that have that those dynamics billy on the other hand okay let's oh, talk my about billy god billy i would like to just Punch him in the face. Well, you would, <laughs> oh. but that's that oh. shows he's an effective character. I know, I cool. know it's the point of the character, but <laughs> and we'll get into this again when we talk into season three. But I wish they'd done like 99% of the time that he is on screen in season two, he is completely disgusting. There's, and I say 99% because we do get that tiny little glimpse into the fact that his father is an abusive asshole. So we know it where it comes from so we, so, yeah stuff. so we get a tiny little bit but we don't get enough there I, I spoke about this before once when we were talking about um stranger things off screen but there were so many times in season two where i legit thought he was going to hit max and that was yeah. like a horrible feeling like i was like if you go there stranger things i will not forgive you do not make me watch a 17 year old kid beat up his 12 year old sister like not gonna happen but he's just so abusive towards her it's horrible and then you drop the racism shit in on top of everything and it's like what are we doing with this character are we just trying to make the vilest thing on earth character who has grown on me over time especially when i see his purpose more (laughs) yeah but in a way you're judging him because you don't like the like the person sort of thing yeah. so but you have to like in shows like this you i understand maybe they don't have to go as far with him but i think they went a little too far but, that, that's all i'm saying i think it was a little too much it, they could have but, reined it back in a little and still made their point mainstream show they're actually not afraid to tackle these issues and they do go a lot darker than you expect to show up like this to go um, mm. So I actually think that's one of the things that justifies having more than one season is you can explore different aspects of 1980s culture 
and the politics. And that's something I'll talk about when we get to season three. But so I, I think that's part of Billy's purpose is he's meant to embody some of this stuff than he might be gay, you know, homosexual. Yes. Because, mm. uh, and you said that's something which quite a few people. Have yeah, liked. a lot of people, a lot of yeah. the fandom has picked that up. I mean, when you look at his, and we talked about this, when you look about his interactions with Steve, they're a little homoerotic. You know? Calls so him like, pretty boy, doesn't yeah. he? He's there Why the are you getting off. that close to him in the shower? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. And if that were the case, if, if the show had gone there, that definitely would have explained his behaviour. I mean, being gay in the 80s in a small American rural town, yeah, that's yeah. not... That, that's not on that's not something that they could have that could have easily been done or would have been easily handled you know it it definitely would have created rage and um a feeling of insecurity within him so it's definitely a good theory but the show hasn't confirmed or denied it yet so right now he's still just an arsehole well he is but he, he's at least an arsehole with an arc <laughs> but, yeah, that's debatable i still well, don't think billy has that great of a like <laughs> they could have given us more <laughs> no no but considering he's a supporting character like he's not mm. one of the main characters so to speak payoff there as well i think the fact that essentially they make us hate this character throughout the season and he's so terrible to max so then it, it actually it's sort of perfect then it's max who finally stands up to him and that's a great it's, moment it's, that, that, that is, is a great, great moment a great moment of a woman taking power back against her abuser i do like that a lot um yeah. but where his art goes in season three and where their dynamic goes in season three i don't feel like season two set it up well enough like about season two with with a certain character is I like what they did with, like, the Doctor with the Owens character as being, like, the equivalent of, like, the... Um, of Brenner, yeah. From the first season. Mm. And actually, he turned out not to be like that. He actually no. turned out to be quite decent. And mm -hmm. ultimately, when push came to shove, he sort of did do the right thing. So yeah. I, I sort of like that. The yeah, he was a good that. character. Yeah, I liked that. that I liked that... Nice. That part of Hopkins was trying to take responsibility for what happened to Will, you know, showing that they were trying, still trying to help him, and he was going for like these weekly visits so they can. I mean, probably part of it is their own science to find out, you know, what's happened to this kid that's gone into this other world. But it does seem yeah. like there is a bit of caring there. And then, you know, towards the end of the season, he helps Hopper, you know, adopt L, and that's really sweet. Or you know, he, he he makes that so that that happens. And so I do like that. I thought his character was quite effective. Um, and I, I'm with you. I, I enjoyed the subversion of, yeah, you think, oh, no, another evil Brenner dude. Yeah. It's another papa. But it's not. He's actually really lovely and, and seems to genuinely want to, to help Will and to help Joyce. So I did think that was a good aspect. Um, but while we're on the topic of new characters, let's talk about Bob. Because I love Bob so much. Oh, Bob Newberry. I'm going to ask, what do you think of Bob? Because I always am always going on about Bob, but you don't seem as keen as me. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I like him. I like him. It's probably not as possible to be as keen as you, but <laughs> I, I do like him because I think he's set up as a bit of a douche. And at, at first you think he's going to be maybe a bit of a nothing character, but he... He definitely has a nice little arc and, yeah, because, like, it's a hard balance to get because they set him up as being just sort of clueless. But I think because of the performance and the way he is with Joyce, I think he's, like, likeable enough where that sort of, like, nerdy type thing, they actually make it quite likeable and, yeah. yeah. Obviously, his whole sacrifice, um, his Aww. yeah, his death is, br is brutal, really. But he gets like one of the most brutal deaths yeah. in the series <laughs> thus far, and he's such a nice guy. I just with Bob, I thought like again, like you, when they when when he first turned up, I was like, oh, Sean Astin, okay, and then it felt like he was going to be a bit of a meh character, you know, just kind of Joyce, yeah. Joyce's new boyfriend. But then you see how much. He adores her, for one. I think that's a really beautiful aspect. He, he genuinely loves yeah. her. 
I really like how he tries with the boys. You know, Jonathan's resisting a bit, but, you know, we have that scene mm. where he drives Will to school and Will's talking about his nightmares and Bob tries to help him by telling him about his scary clown and how he told him to go away. And I really like yeah. how concerned he is for Joyce's welfare and for the boys' welfare, you know, talking about them moving away together to get a new start, talking about helping them find security and safety and... I know that everyone loves Joyce and Hopper, and I get that. But for me, I wanted her to end up with Bob because I mm. thought Bob was so perfect for her because he was so normal and so stable. Now, I love Hopper. I really do. But he's a mess, man. Okay? He's got a whole <laughs> set of his own problems to deal with that Joyce doesn't need to be taking on, you know, because she's got her own stuff. She needs someone who is more stable than Hopper, at least in my opinion. And I know that they're they're, they're going through Joyce and Hopper. And, and I, I won't – like, if that does happen, I'll be fine with that. But yeah. there was something so pure and so sweet and so simple and lovely about Bob. And I really liked how the series went on. And as he got more and more involved in this world and in their world, and he learned about underground tunnels and the Hopkins lab and everything that he just kept taking it in his stride, you know, you know, he, he, I mean, I think at one point he even says to Joyce, he's like, I knew when I when I started, I knew this was a different family. I knew that I was taking on your problems and your kids' problems. And he just doesn't care. And then he has that fantastic bit at the end where he, he helps them get out of the building. And I love when, yeah. when he's saying, you know, you need to learn this system. And Hopper's like, okay, so teach it to me. And he's like, yeah, I don't think so, buddy. This is not something I can teach you in like two minutes. I'm going to uh -huh. have to go and do this myself. And then his death is just, I mean, for a horror, if we're looking at this from a horror fan's point of view, fantastic fucking death man yeah. like such yeah. a good death torn apart by the demogorgons great special effects but like it's bob and, and they, then you find yeah. out that he founded the av club that the, that the boys are a part oh, of. Oh, yeah, that's a really nice it. touch, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I I do love at the end how you see his picture up on the on the refrigerator and it's like Bob Newberry superhero. So they at least give him that. But, like, just everything about Bob, I just love Bob. And the fact that he's played by Sean Astin just makes it even, like, better because it's I love Sean perfect, Astin as well. It yeah, really once is. Once again, deliberate casting because he mm -hmm. made his name in, like, 80s films. So yes. It's Yes, sort of. he did. It seems like, yeah, everyone who's a guest star, they go for that, don't they? Because Raisin mm -hmm. made his name in 80s films. And I noticed, actually, I don't know if you... Well, I, I've already mentioned it, but Robert England has a role in the new one. Um, yes, that would be awesome. He's actually in the cast list, so that's going to be interesting to see what he does. I wonder who he'll be playing, because I've noticed with Robert is a lot of the roles I see him in, he, he plays like really straight characters. It's like, you yeah. know, he's got Freddy who's like his ultimate character. And then in his, in his private life or in his, the rest of his acting life, he likes to take like to more something. chill roles, you know, sure. roles that are very different. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see if they're going to bring him in as a bad guy. And if they do, how they're going to play it, or if he's going to be a good guy and completely subvert the expectations that you have, you know, you see Robert England, you immediately think, Oh my God, Freddy, but he could be playing something completely different. So Actually, how you, like Karen as a character and, oh, Karen. and I like her as well I think she's a great mother and has some great scenes with Nancy there's there's a good scene in season three actually between them sort of yes. after she's had like the fight with Jonathan and what have you but mm. um I, I know you mentioned at some point just randomly how you think the show ruins her later on. Uh, now, does that happen in this season or is it's, it more? Well, the decline starts in this season. Okay. So one thing I noticed in this season is that she's really not around a lot which was she's really weird involved. for me because in season one, she's very involved, you know, she brings Joyce a casserole. She's always trying to find out what's going on with her kids. You know, she's, she, she ends up even being involved with the agents come to her house. She, she feels like a very involved and very caring mother. And then in this, this season, it's like, she just vanishes. Um, yeah. She's barely in the show. And then like the one full scene we get with her is when Billy comes to the front door and he's standing there with his shirt open or like, Hey, and she just turns into like this giggling little schoolgirl, and I'm like, woman, he is 17 years old. Get your shit together. It feels out of place with the other stuff with Billy, and mm. 
because bearing in mind he's looking for the kids and yeah. you're sort of heading for a really dark scene after that. I find it because, I mean, first of all, I think it's a funny scene. And and secondly, it's sort of like, I think this show, obviously, it's a big prestige. And I think that's prestige in a, a certain kind of, like, sort of fiction. This picture of, of Karen and her sort of husband having not the best marriage like he's mm. you know he he takes her for granted he's not the yeah. best father and you know he's sort of like asleep in the chair or something i think where when billy comes calling but um but like because there's a set where she's in the bath and she's actually reading like a romance and i think there's actually a clever touch where the the character on front of the book looks a lot like billy which <laughs> which is pretty funny but that's sort of how i justify it i just think it's like one of these scenes where it's like a prestige and they're just going for something a bit more I, mean, I, I, I definitely get where you're coming from but by the same token why ruin karen's well not ruin but why, why deal with yeah. karen's character you know and i i understand that her marriage is not great like they they definitely mm. lay that out in season one when nancy's like you know my mom was young my dad was older and established they basically just got married and have kids because that's what you do so i understand and in even in season one they do show parts of karen being unhappy in her marriage but in season one she's like she's a support a friend she's a good mother she's trying yeah. to understand both her kids she's trying to be involved with both her kids in this one she doesn't even notice that her kids are gone for 48 hours you know like both nancy and mike just vanish for like a good portion of the season and she doesn't even seem to notice and well again, ma like... maybe she was at work a lot of that time. I don't know. I would have uh, to go back and look at the certain scenes, Actually, I think it's but... actually worse in season three when, like, all the kids vanish for, like, several days and none of the parents notice. That's, like, a whole thing. But, and uh, I think sometimes I get uncomfortable when, when TV shows do certain storylines or create certain dynamics yeah. between characters that are unequal. Billy is disgusting, but he is still an underage teenage boy and a grown housewife should not be flirting with him. You know, like you should know better than to write that sort of thing in. And it gets even worse in season three when you have all the mothers like ogling him down at the swimming pool. It's like, let's reverse the I genders think. here, okay? Let's go with a what? bunch of 40 year old men ogling a teenage girl in a bikini and see how well that would fly with viewers. It does work though, you've just pointed out the exact reason it, it does sort of work, because they are reversing the gay sort of thing. And okay, I... <laughs> no, no, but first of all, he probably for his age, he does look quite mature. I, I mean, I'm guessing the actor is maybe more in his 20s than I don't think he's as young as he's meant to be playing. So... yeah. Maybe if you see someone like that show up at your door, maybe you assume that he's at least, you know, 23, 24, whatever. Um, and I guess I just don't, I'm just not as bothered as you because I just see it as a prestige <laughs> and it's lighthearted. I don't think. Fair enough. You're I can understand to, that. Like read it as literal sort of thing. I can get where but... you're coming from, but I just find, especially <laughs> in TV shows, there are so many. Yeah. There are so many examples of this sort of dynamic happening. And again, I'm like, look, I know it's fiction, and I know that you know we shouldn't take it too seriously. But by the same token, it's like fiction does reflect reality, yeah. and there are so many shows out there where there are all these uneven dynamics between adults and teenagers that just that just made me uncomfortable. And the fact that in season three she even considers sleeping with him i'm like honey you better pray he's 18 by this point okay like <laughs> get check his id before you go there um but yeah look karen i think in season two is not so bad i feel like they just kind of more forgot about her in season two or maybe it's just that they added yeah. all these new characters so they didn't really have space to to concentrate on the characters that were uh, left I, I think that's maybe it yeah. yeah and i think it's more that karen for me in season one was such a surprise yeah. that I ended up loving her because she was such a subversion, kind of similar to Steve. And then I felt that with Steve in season two, they continue his arc, but they kind of stopped Karen's arc. So yeah. that's kind of what it me. It was more that they forgot about her when she was, for me at least, a really good supporting character in season one, but then she just kind of vanishes in season two. The nature of season one, it's sort of 
lent it to having more yeah. of her because you obviously yeah. had a lot more based around the house and it was a slower burn and yeah. obviously because of what Joyce was going for through you know yeah. it made sense to have Karen supporting her emotionally Jonathan and Nancy um uh, because first of all Steve <laughs> yeah you have to talk about Steve alongside this stuff because of course they start the season and he is still with Nancy um mm -hmm. and we obviously find out Nancy's favorite word is bullshit especially when she's <laughs> strong <laughs> which is really funny but <laughs> yeah so Poor obviously Steve. we sort of knew it was well when when we found out there was a season two i, I think we knew it was probably going to come then because it seemed like a natural progression so, um. i didn't i thought she would stay with steve in season two because they completely I... subverted my expectations at the end of season one she chose steve and i was like oh okay and then they just fucked it all up. Sorry, excuse my French in this in this one. It, it's getting very strong. Um, but uh, okay. So the Nancy and Jonathan stuff wouldn't annoy me as much if it was framed differently. But it's not. So we've got Nancy and Steve. They start out at the beginning. They're still together. But we find out she's still got a crush on Jonathan. Okay, fair enough. It happens. Mm -hmm. They're teenagers. Teenagers. This sort of stuff happens. When she gets drunk at the party and she's doing the bullshit thing, I don't think that was a great moment for her. But again, she's a teenager. She's going through PTSD. She's got a whole lot going on. What I don't like she's drunk. is that, yeah. yeah, she's drunk and she's saying horrible things. But what I really don't like is that she runs off with Jonathan. She cheats on Steve with Jonathan. Jonathan and then instead of coming back and saying to Steve, I'm really sorry, Jonathan and I got together. I'm sorry I hurt you. Can we still be friends? They have Steve say that he is a shitty boyfriend. When he's Which not. She is. He no, is. No, he is. Not. No, he is. Is. no, he is. He is. How? How is he a shitty because boyfriend? Because we've, we've seen that over the course of the show up to now. We've seen him have good moments and subvert our expectations. But. Mm. No, because even then, because. For example, if you take that party scene and following up from that, like Steve, the way he acts the next day is terrible. And one thing I pointed out in my review is he's getting all shitty and jealous over Jonathan. And she mentions, oh, you know, didn't you notice your, your other boyfriend, Jonathan, took you home? He asked Jonathan to, to, to take her home. So why is he getting shitty then saying, oh, your other boyfriend took you home? He asked him. Well, to be honest, I, when I did the review, I questioned this because I, I don't remember seeing that happen. But he definitely... No. Because I think it's Jonathan who says it to Nancy, like when he takes her home. He says Steve asks, because he sort of defends Steve. He, he like, you know, stands up for him and kind of says, you know, he, he was just worried about you. And he does mention. Is Jonathan making that up? Just because I don't remember. Because, okay, again, I, I, I haven't rewatched it in a while. Making it but up, as far but... as I remember, Nancy goes off at him in the bathroom and he just storms out of the party. And I think Jonathan just decides to take Nancy home because someone needs to take her home. And I don't think Steve asked him to. Okay. I think Steve just ends up leaving the party. So that's probably why he's being. But you know what? After all the shit she said to him in the bathroom, I think he's entitled to be upset. She basically told him that she doesn't love him and that she doesn't want to be with him. And they've been together for like a year at this point. So she's been stringing him along for a year. Well, no, I, no, hang on, hang on. I question your use of words there. I don't think stringing okay. him along is, is fair. And, you know, it works both ways. She has generally been a very loyal girlfriend to him. And I don't think he's bad in that scene, Steve, even though I accept that there's some... Like, I'm not quite sure if he did ask, if John, if he asked Jonathan to take her home or not. But, okay, I, I can read that as Jonathan was just saying that. And Jonathan was actually doing that maybe to stick up a little bit for Steve. But mm. whatever, I, I can accept that maybe Steve didn't ask him to do that. I can read that. But I just, also, I just think 
up to this point, and obviously things changed this season, but up to that point, he's actually had no reason to be jealous of them. In so- well, bar one scene in season one, which obviously gets, you know, as we know, was innocent. And I'm sure she told Steve that later on. But bar that one scene, there's actually been no reason for Steve not to trust her. So I actually think the stuff he says is a bit much. Um, but it's coming off of the night before where she basically told him yeah. that he sucks. And that it's bullshit and that she doesn't want to be with him. So he's responding to the fact that she has admitted that she's not into their relationship. And I mean, when you see them in the build up, he's still sweet with her. He goes with her to Barb's parents for dinner, even though he's got no connection to Barb whatsoever. And he's been doing this, obviously, for the full year. He tells her he loves her, he reassures her, he tries to help her, he tries to take her mind off things, and then she just turns around and gets drunk and spews all this shit at him. Well, I, I just don't think he was a shitty boyfriend. I think he was fine up until the party when he's responding to her and okay, kind of being not a dick. Them as a natural couple, and obviously we had that disagreement over a scene in season <laughs> one. And But to me, I think Steve is a character who because of his arc, he slowly grows up during the course of the show. And we see, because uh, he's he's definitely immature and a bit dorkish. And, you know, we sort of see that early in season two because, you know, Nancy's trying to help him with like an important, like essay type thing mm. to maybe try and get into college. And it seems as though he doesn't take that stuff as seriously and... Sometimes he still goofs about like he does in a certain scene in the hallway with her and Jonathan. And obviously I'm not saying there's anything wrong with goofing about and being a bit immature when you're that age and stuff. But I think it just highlights again that they are in different places and that maybe they don't have that much in common. Um, and I totally get that. And I would be yeah. absolutely, like I said, for me, it's all about the framing. It's about the fact that they try to make out like Nancy has done nothing wrong. Like Steve is just a shit boyfriend and therefore she has license to go and cheat with on, on him with Jonathan. I would have much preferred for that to happen and then for Nancy to come back and for her and Steve to actually have a talk and 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 for them to maybe both apologize for anything they've done wrong but she cheats on steve she gets away with it and then they paint him as the bad guy and i am just not on board with that because steve harrington is a perfect angel who can do no wrong no i'm joking obviously but i'm just saying i think that season two makes him out to be the bad guy when in reality it was probably a combination of them growing apart nancy not communicating steve maybe not listening and it was definitely not a one-sided thing and i don't like that nancy gets to go off and cheat with jonathan and be happy and steve comes back and says oh yeah i was a shit boyfriend i deserve to be cheated on it's like no fuck you nancy (laughs) be a man be a woman stand up and tell him that you like someone else okay it happens you're teenagers you know teenagers are stupid you usually have a crush on two or three people at the same time you don't know who you want to be with what are you saying as just the character well them together as characters because obviously i think one of the things for me and the reason i sort of i'm not as bothered about the relationship as you um mm. is because a lot of their characters and what they go through it's not really about romance anyway so that's why it doesn't bother me. Uh, and I think to put it to you another way, because I mean, realistically, because, you know, one of the episodes in season three I reviewed recently, I said, and I think it's just when they have the fight and I'm just like, yeah, I don't care about that scene because because it just feels in a way like typical team romance type drama that mm. I don't really care about sitting through in in a show like stranger things but but that's the point as well with steve is i i just feel for the sake of the two characters steve had to go his separate ways nancy had to go her separate ways and both benefit from that they're much more interesting characters apart than they are together yeah Um, i i do agree with that um like I said, my my issue is not that Steve and Nancy broke up. 
Yeah. I mean, I thought maybe they would stay together, but given that they okay. didn't, because I mean, I don't feel strongly about Nancy, so it's not like I ship them or I'm like, oh my god, they must be together. For me, like I keep saying, it's it's just about the framing. How do I get together with Jonathan? Whatever. I really don't care about those two either way. Um, I think that Murray's creepy, but um, I I. I don't think the way they got together was that organic, but if they're together, that's fine. But just don't try and paint Steve Harrington as the bad guy here. You have that with her and Steve, where a a lot of their stuff is it's just typical teen romance drama. Mm. So so I kind of, yeah, I'm not so into it. but, But I just think, as I said, Steve is a more interesting character when he's not with Nancy. You know, I get that because he, he definitely is. him getting involved in the kids and the whole thing with Dustin. Him and is, Dustin, it is fantastic. Aren't they, yeah, aren't they just the best duo? Absolutely. Him and Dustin, Love it. so good. Um, and that was such an unexpected dynamic. You know, like you went into yeah. season two expecting certain dynamics. You knew that Hopper and Elle were going to get close. You knew that Nancy and Jonathan were going to happen. Who could have predicted that? Steve and Dustin would end up being like yeah. little deep answers <laughs> together. Like that was just so cool. And I loved that he brought him to the prom at the end, you know, and advised him on how Giving to do this. Him hair. Advice. And yeah, you've got the whole Farrah so Fawcett cute. hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I just, I loved fantastic. it. I thought the two actors had really great chemistry. And I thought they really made that work. I love when they're setting the traps for the Demogorgon and yeah. he's gone out the, to fight them. And Max is like, oh, my God, he's insane. And Dustin's like, he's so cool. And yeah. I'm like, yes. <laughs> so I thought that dynamic was really fun. I really liked that one. Yeah. And then obviously moving forward into season three, that just expands and you get that nice little yeah. group of characters as well. But well, so, not so nice. We could lose one of them, but we'll no, talk about no, that when totally we get to season wrong. three. You're totally wrong. <laughs> um, but OK, so the stuff with Jonathan, Nancy and UFO guy and I've forgotten his name. Murray's his name. Murray, apparently. I think. Okay, <laughs> I'll go with that because I can't remember his name. But generally, a character I enjoy. Um, now, you don't like that scene, the scene where obviously, you know, they, they kind of get drunk and he pushes them together and that stuff. Well, I think I think I know why you don't like it, but just, just explain a bit more why you don't like it. Okay, first of all, it's creepy. Why do we have so many adults giving doing inappropriate things with underage kids on the show who was giving underage kids alcohol it's and not... them to run off and have sex yeah Does but, someone but... Have condoms i hope someone has condoms or jonathan and nancy are in for a nasty surprise <laughs> yeah i'm sure they must have <laughs> i condoms. think about these things Sorry. well you do <laughs> I, 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 I didn't think because they're they're i think at that age, they're pr- they're close enough to adults, so it's yeah. not look really... the, the drinking age here. And is she 18, already had, so it's, and it's, yeah. she already had sex with Steve. Don't forget. that's not really a big deal. That's just me being pedantic. Yeah. I have a real issue when other characters tell characters how they're feeling. All right, yeah. point of reference. Angel, okay, so on the show Angel, you've got in season three, everyone telling Angel and Cordelia that they're in love with each other. It's like, how would you know? You're not in their head. And this dude, who doesn't know anything about anything, is all like, oh, yeah, you two should be together because you're young and hot. You have shared trauma and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, oh, my God. It it feels forced to me. I rather, I would have rather, again, I would have rather Nancy and Jonathan maybe have a few drinks, stay up late, talk about their shared experiences and start making out and blah, blah, blah. Why do you have to have some creepy old UFO conspiracy theory dude come in and tell you this is what your relationship is? And he does it again in season three with Joyce and Hopper, which we're going to talk about when we get to that as well. It's like he just comes in to be the mouthpiece for, for telling people that they should be together. <laughs> doesn't bother me as much and they they i think at least with jonathan and nancy you've had this build up like you have seen them a lot together and there's even this thing i think they they sort of mentioned and then over the summer they've been spending more time together a, a little bit although i think they do highlight at one point there's been quite a long period apart um because they didn't know really how to 
broach the subject and mm. it was but quite awkward thing for a while. thing that does come up, which again annoys me just a little bit, is when Nancy tells Jonathan, oh, I waited for you. And she's like, and you didn't get your shit together and ask me out. And he's like, yeah, dude, I was dealing with like all this stuff, like my brother going to like a different dimension and you waited for like a month. So I know it's not supposed to come across like this, but it really does come across as Nancy wanted Jonathan. He didn't get his act together as fast as she wanted. So she rebounded or fell onto her back up with Steve. And it yeah. makes Nancy, for me, it makes Nancy look a little bit callous, you know, like she's just, she just has, it's like if Jonathan wasn't, if Jonathan was taking his time, why wouldn't she just stay single? Why did she have to go back to Steve when she didn't really want to be with him? Is she so desperate that she can't be alone? She doesn't seem like that sort of character, you know? So I mm. found it odd that they, they threw that in. I think it would have been more, again, I think it would have been better if it had been, oh, I went back to Steve because I thought that's what I wanted, but it turned out I was wrong. I find it quite entertaining and... <laughs> Fair enough. You know, it might, it, in a way, it's a bit of a stereotypical, you know, drunk get together scene and the yeah. way it's filmed. But yeah, I, I don't hate Murray. I, I find his character quite entertaining. <laughs> and, you know, I, and it's definitely a funny scene because, uh, you know, you, you have the good bit next morning, uh, you know, where. Um, but, oh, that's a great, I hate that lot. That's so funny. <laughs> How's the pull out? Oh, that's that's oh, fantastic. Red. I hope she did pull out considering they don't have any condoms. But <laughs> yeah. just, oh, oh man, this talk is getting very X rated. If you're under 18, stop watching this. Yeah. Stop watching the video. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, it's a funny line. It's still gross. I have to say, though, because I've said a whole lot of negative shit. I'll say something positive. I do like the scene because I think it's really cute when Nancy and Jonathan are in the hotel room and she pulls out, like she shows a scar and she's like, do you still have yours? And he he holds out his hand too. And they're kind of remembering, you know, taking okay. on the Demogorgon together. I thought that was a cute scene. I thought that was a cute scene. So now that scene felt organic. That scene felt yeah. like the two of them bonding over their past trauma and becoming closer. If they continued in that manner, it would have been a bit better, but I thought I thought that scene was cute, and I really do like at the end of the season how Nancy dances with Dustin at the at the. That, that's snowflake. really good. I thought um, that was a great character moment for Nancy, like a really sweet moment that you know she sees this this lost lonely kid, and she's like, I, I need to make him feel better, you know, let him let him have his night. I thought that was a really sweet character moment for Nancy. Yeah, me too, and and it's also so perfect because Dustin had a crush on her for a while and yeah. the whole context of the scene is so perfect because she obviously she is seen as like this popular attractive girl around yeah. school so the fact that the girls who have rejected him then sees him dancing with with one of the popular girls and grown up mm. you know it sort of adds to the scene so yeah. Yeah, that's really good. That that was a nice sort of end to the season and mm. it's a good way to end with like a dance and obviously subverts it a little bit because then you get the very end which which is like the monsters being really pissed <laughs> and, and yeah. getting ready for, for <laughs> That's the a next really season. nice final shot, I will say. I do like that final very shot good. where they flip it upside down and you see the monster in the upside down. So I want to ask you while we're talking about dynamics dynamics, yeah. um, what your thoughts are on Ellen Hop this season and their building of their father daughter dynamic. Did do you like that, that yeah, particular yeah. thread? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think we've said before that Joyce and Hopper feel like the sort of parents to like all the kids in the show. It feels like yeah. that way. And they take on that role, regardless of if you think of them as like a couple or not. They definitely yeah. sort of take on that role. And mm. yeah, his stuff with Elle is, is great. And the way they go it through is, isn't it? through all the rules and like the consequences of that and just stuff like that how he sets the rules and obviously there's some quite useful flashbacks and stuff in in, in the season once again but yeah no it's really good i like their chemistry and as i said i like that whole father daughter dynamic it obviously yeah. makes sense because he obviously lost his daughter 
Um, I also like actually the scene when when she returns and they see her for the first time, and I, yeah. I I like Mike's reaction, how pissed he is at Hopper, which yeah, you, you totally guess get, but it's it's a great mm-hmm. scene for Hopper because he reacts in just the appropriate sort of way where he doesn't like go off on Mike. Um, like they have a little bit of a spa, but he, he just stands there and takes it and sort of gives him a hug and says, I, I know, I know, sort of thing. So I know. Oh, a it makes really my heart hurt. So, it is. Yeah. I love so, Hopper and Elle. I think the last couple of episodes are fantastic. And yes. Really land. Unfortunately, we have to talk a bit a bit about a negative before that. Um, yeah, we do. <laughs> so, so this will be one that we agree on definitely because mm-hmm. th- that famous episode number seven is for me easily the worst episode of the whole show up to mm-hmm. now. And rewatching it, it didn't get any better. Um, nope. I think rewatching it, it's probably worse because I think it's. I think it's partly because you're waiting for it to come and so you're maybe dreading it a little bit and Mm -hmm. I guess when you watch things for the first time it's a bit different anyway Um, so I think re-watching it this time that episode was more of a slog to get through Um, and I think they made a couple of mistakes with it I think first of all it was a mistake in this show to have a whole episode dedicated to one character. Yes, I think you need that mixture, like cutting back and forth and mm-hmm. obviously Al is part of a group or you have other groups. So I think to, to dedicate a whole episode to one character was a mistake because there, even if you go with this storyline in this episode, there was still... You know, it's like a 46-minute episode. There was still yeah. time to have a little bit from the other characters, maybe. So mm-hmm. that was a mistake. And obviously, it's even more so because it's in a different location with characters that we don't know. But mm-hmm. the other thing, it feels like a needless detour. And it's a little yeah. bit weak the way it sort of comes about because I did like the stuff with Al you know, looking for her birth mother and yes, looking I like that this yeah. stuff. There was some good stuff with that, but yeah. this it felt like a need to sort of detour. It it did feel mm-hmm. like like they didn't come up with enough of a reason for Al to take this trip to Chicago. Yeah. And and it's just a bad episode overall. Like because those other characters, they were just really boring. They they weren't they were. very interesting to watch um they just went the stereotypical type you know characters and mm-hmm. and yeah there was just like cheesy moments like you know like the whole butterfly thing or the thing with the creature with that you know like her sister where she could control things and enjoyed i i thought you know the scene where they they found like the guy who was in like the lab originally, who mm. they held responsible. Uh, that, that, that was quite a good scene. But overall, yeah, it was a slog of an episode. And I think they needed to make those characters sort of more likable or maybe more interesting to watch because it's like when they're like rumshacking the store and they're using their powers and they're bullying in like this innocent shop owner and yeah we don't know these characters so we can't really care about this like because no. we don't know if outside of this scene they're actually like more sympathetic or not mm. so yeah yeah i agree I, I think I liked the concept of Elle finding other children because her being number 11, I remember in the first season being like, okay, if she's number 11, where are numbers 1 through to 10? You know, obviously there hmm. are more kids. So opening the season, showing us another kid, I thought that was a cool concept. 
I am always happy when there's Indian characters on screen. So I love the fact that Kali was a Desi character. That was cool. But then they did nothing with her. I completely agree that it should not have been a bottle episode. Like, we shouldn't have had an episode just focused on Elle. It, it just took us way too out of the, the narrative of the rest of the season. Like you said, the characters, I completely agree with everything you said. The characters were flat. <laughs> we only had the one episode to get to know them in, so they couldn't really do much with them. Yeah. I feel like Carly had potential. Like, I could see in her character that there was potential there. I thought her power was kind of interesting. I thought the fact that she and Elle immediately kind of recognised in one another that they were bonded by this trauma that they were sisters but then she just then they just didn't do anything with her you yeah. know and she turned on l so quickly towards the end yeah. i just yeah it was it was the weird episode i feel like it'll fit into that dynamic very well i don't think the minority felt like a backdoor pilot you know how you have shows where they have yeah. speaking with backdoor pilots with spin-offs that's what this felt like, but it didn't feel yeah. like a good backdoor pilot. It just felt like it had just been dropped in the middle of the season. And I think that it gets worse the second time around because you really realize how useless it is within the narrative. You know, the yeah. first time you watch it, you think, oh, maybe this will go somewhere. It was a bad episode, but maybe it'll lead somewhere. But then when you watch it on a rewatch, you know that it's not going to go anywhere. So it's just, you just have to stop for a full 45 minutes. You have to stop and watch this group of people that you just don't give a crap about. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, definitely a bad episode. Episode. See the next time I do a rewatch, just not watching it because, like, yeah. in a way, the first two times I had to watch it. Like the first time mm. I was watching the show for the first time, and yeah. this time because I was reviewing the show, I still yeah. had to watch it. And <laughs> it, I was intrigued to see how I felt about it watching rewatching it this time. Um, mm. So. Yeah, I, I could actually see myself skipping it if I Just did that. Because you can. There's nothing that happens in it that's important enough that you need to watch it. You could just skip it, and I don't think it would make any difference to the Yeah, because it's only partly referenced, because they obviously notice mm. her dressed as a punk. Her, her dress differently, but, like, that's it. That's about it, yeah. Because mm. you even easily could wreck on it as she just went off somewhere and we didn't mm. see it like it was off camera yeah. or you just leave yeah. it open. Is Elle's arc up until that, I think, is a great one for season two. I think I really like watching her grow a little bit. Um, as we were talking about before, her and Hopper are a great dynamic. I think it really shows the two characters growing and learning. You know, Hopper has had a daughter before, but he hasn't had a tween daughter, and this is a new dynamic. Um, I think the fight they have is so heartbreaking, especially when she screams at him, you are just like Papa, and he's like, really? Really? I'm like that psycho that locked you up? I'm like the one that, I'm like that? And, you know, they, they have that whole fight, but then there's that beautiful scene where Hopper Hopper is speaking um, to her over the radio and he's like, you know, I'm really sorry. I know that, you know, things haven't been that great recently. I'm going to try harder. Plus, there's some really funny moments with her and Hopper. Like that scene where he brings her to the cabin and he puts the music on and he starts doing the dad dance. That's and she's good. just like... Yeah what yeah. <laughs> i just love the look she's giving him like oh my god or you know when she turns up behind him wearing the sheet and he's just like oh geez and she's like yeah. ghost halloween and you know <laughs> when he he has the waffles with her and it just it's beautiful and i love their reconciliation and how they talk in the truck and you know they decide to communicate more and he's all like you know i was really and she's like stupid and he's like yeah stupid and she's like I'm stupid too. Yeah. And then they have that really sweet moment. And then of course they have that moment where they go to close the gate. And that is such an awesome That's moment great for Elle. Scene. That is like that Elle's like dark Phoenix moment, you know, <laughs> like you see her at like the full height of her powers. And I just think that scene is actually, I can't believe I'm going to say this because I, I, because you know, I'm, I'm so like season one should just be the only season, but I think that scene is one of the best in the series yeah. that that scene where she, when she starts levitating and she's screaming and she's closing the gate because you really see her powers in full force there. Like I said, it's her dark Phoenix moment. It's a, it's a great, yeah. great moment there. So and I love her reunion with Mike. I agree that her, like Mike's reaction is so sad and his moment yeah. with Hopper where Hop takes them aside. Oh, and I love when That's she really reunites good. with Lucas and Dustin and she's like, you have teeth. What, when did you get teeth, you know? Oh, yeah, and he, yeah. he's like, oh, yeah, you like these pearls? And he yeah, because like, that's the thing he's like, doing Whoa. Like, when yeah. he's flirting with Max earlier in the season. Uh -huh. 
That's pretty yeah. funny. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so. I, I think that Ellen Hopper, yeah, it's a great thing. So, like I said, I think for the most um, part, the characterization of season two is really great. Just don't think it was necessary. I think it delivers as as a sequel. Like, I think it delivers those Stranger Things moments that you probably still want to be there. But it does have new stuff as well. Like, it freshens yeah. things up. Um, but I, I guess I uh, get that. And I sort of get the thing that it's good and it still feels like a Stranger Things show. But it's maybe a, a lesser version of yeah you know, but it's just expanding on it and obviously because of season one being the first season and being a mystery then the pacing was was probably very different um mm. i will say actually i would say season two actually went up for me on this rewatch um okay. i think i liked mm. it even more because i remember when i first watched for it was a bit slow at the beginning but i mean actually that didn't bother me this time round um because mm. i think i was really into like what they were doing with the characters and um i really liked the halloween episode for example yes. I, yeah. I love the stuff at the arcade and and things like that so mm. yeah i think it actually went up for me and i think there's definitely an argument then it actually has an even stronger end than season one. You know, I think the finale might be even better than season one's finale. Um, mm. Cause I've heard someone say then comparing the seasons, like season one's more consistent as a season, but the highs in season two might be even higher than the highs in season one. Uh, I'm not saying I agree, mm. but you can have that debate. And mm. like I said, I think that's what's so frustrating about that episode seven, because mm. once you get beyond that, like most of the stuff before that's great. And obviously you have a really good, like two, sort of feels a bit like a two-part end of the season those last two episodes so it's mm. just a little frustrating then you you take this detour which isn't really needed and it does sort of mm. kill the momentum they had anyway definitely yeah so mm. it's interesting you you could make a case then if you took that episode out then it might be you know i think it's not far off season one anyway but you you could make the argument it might be as good if if you didn't have that episode